Thank you, Wayne. I could just tell you that if I knew as much about this topic as Wayne knows about church history, uh, then uh, I would be well satisfied. I appreciate the invitation to come and be here. I know that after hearing these uh, young men uh, speak and Ray do such a great job, if you could take a vote, uh, most people would say, let's just go home and call it a night. But um, I appreciate the uh, the call that Philip made uh, that day. In fact, I think it's pretty interesting that, Philip, when you had called to confirm that you wanted me to come and speak on the subject of maintaining balance in uh, bivocational ministry, I mentioned that to Rebecca, and she said, in other words, are you going to tell them to do all the things opposite of what you've done? And... Uh, I think that was a joke, but I'm not really sure. But uh, you know the definition of an expert is someone who has gotten it wrong so many times that uh, they know a little bit more about what they were talking about. And I can tell you that having balance in uh, bivocational ministry is not an easy thing to do. At least it has not been for me. Uh, my experience with it actually goes back uh, even beyond the age of 15, Wayne. When I was nine years old, I remember coming home one uh, Wednesday night uh, from Bible study. And at that time, my dad was a truck driver. And although at that time he was not a Christian, uh, at that point in time in his life, I had a great admiration and love for him. And I also had a great love and admiration for our local minister there in my hometown congregation. And I told my mom, I said, Mother, I know what I want to do with my life. Here I was nine years old. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a preacher and I want to be a truck driver. <laughs> and now I, I never gained the uh, vocation of being a minister, but I did find out <laughs> being a uh, truck driver, but I did find out that when you preach, the time will come that you will know how to drive the U-Haul truck. Yes. And so I, but I, I remember telling her, I want to be a minister and I want to be a truck driver. And so when uh, when I was, uh, as Wayne said, when I was 15 years old, I uh, I had opportunities to preach in little congregations where they had no preachers. So they thought, okay, we get JT to come and preach. You may not do a great job or we have no preacher at all. And we get you, brother so-and-so, to do it. Well, let's have JT come. So I, I was able to get a lot of experience doing that. But at the same time, while I was in high school, my 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 plans were to go to Western Kentucky University and major in agriculture. And I just remember that that was what was on my mind. But as I began to, uh, more I began to preach, there was one day on one Sunday afternoon that I was introduced to a man visiting my hometown by the name of Brother Charles Corp. And uh, that changed my life forever because it eventually led me to coming to uh, Heritage or then, of course, International uh, Bible College. But I can tell you that it wasn't until the other night that I actually sat down and numbered the years it, that I've been in what's been called full-time ministry and those times when I've had another job uh, along with preaching. And I don't know who came up with the term of part-time preaching, but hmm. it was not a minister, I can tell you that. Right. Uh, but for the lack of a better term, we talk about full-time preaching and part-time preaching. But could you imagine where the brotherhood would be today if we suddenly lost all the brethren that uh, were preaching in our pulpits that already currently hold a job in some other way in which they support their families? In fact, I don't know what the ratios are exactly, but I would dare say that we probably have more men in many areas that fill that role then fill that full-time located work. And as I said, I've, I've spent years where I've been in located works and, and that was my only, uh, that was my day job and my evening job and my night job. Uh, but I can tell you that one of the hardest things that I found was making that transition when I would 
go into a another uh, situation where I might be working in a secular job, it was hard to leave that full-time mindset behind. And my wife, Rebecca, would be the first one to tell you that uh, because of that, that's why I have gray hair. Uh, is uh, that it was hard to leave that mindset behind because in my thought, I'm still at the hospitals every day I, I, or when I need to be. And I'm, I, I'm at, you know, doing so many Bible studies and making so many visits and preaching so many sermons and, and committing myself in so many different ways that it was very difficult that once I found that balance, or uh, to find that balance, uh, it was so very hard. Uh, for the last 13 years, uh, I've worked as a, a realtor, and I can tell you that one of the great blessings of that has been that it's given me the opportunity uh, to do some things uh, for the Lord and for the church and, and for myself and my family that I would perhaps not have had if I had been, let's say, punching a time clock. So I've had a little bit more flexibility. But at the same time, uh, getting that balance is another thing. Sometimes you don't know whether you're going to feel guilty or not if you hand out a business card at the funeral home. <laughs> and you, you think, is that the right thing to do? It, it, how do I make that transition of, uh, of bringing one part of my life and, and molding it into the other part, and at the same time, still being a father and being a husband? So I don't stand here as an expert to tell you that I know all about it, but I know as I look back to the early church, you see, when Jesus gave the Great Commission there in Mark 16 or Matthew 28, he didn't put it on the backs of quote-unquote full-time ministers. It was on men who were tent makers, men who were fishermen, men who had, uh, they weren't born to be preachers or and at that time apostles and, and ministers. There were men who grew up and in their families and learned, that had learned to trade and, and, and then when Christ became the central focus of their life, they went on, in many cases, committing themselves fully to the Lord, but at the same time, some of them were still working to support their families. When the dispersion came there in Acts 8, when many of the Christians, because of persecution, were cast out or departed from Jerusalem, they didn't have a, a need that stopped to feed their families and a need to pro provide shelter. There was still a need to do what the Lord wanted them to do to grow the church. But there was still that need there for, uh, for family. And so it is not always easy to know what is the right thing to do. I remember our oldest child, uh, when she was about... Uh, six years old, she was staying with a babysitter. And I was working in full-time work at that time. And uh, when I came uh, back to the house to uh, pick our daughter up, uh, the babysitter said, I, I want to tell you something very interesting that uh, Carissa said uh, when she steps away. And so when she stepped away, she said, uh, Carissa asked me today, uh, why does my dad not have a job? And, and so uh, the babysitter said, well, your dad does have a job. And she said, no, he, he doesn't have a job. Not, not like the other fathers. Uh, he doesn't have a job. And she said, well, your dad uh, preaches and he visits the sick and, and, he does, and she listed these things. And she said, oh, I thought he just did that because he was a Christian. And so even in her mindset, it was hard for her to uh, quite not, not to be able to grasp uh, the difference. And so years later, uh, I made that decision to go into a secular work and to do, as they say, uh, part-time ministry. And then upon being that tent maker and, and, and participating in other trades, there was that time when... I decided to go back into a fully located work and did that for several years. And then there was a time that I stepped down from that and, 
and, and went back and uh, worked with the schools and some other areas that, uh, that I felt were very important to me. And then I went from there. Uh, not being able to make up my mind, went back into full-time ministry for the past uh, 22 years in one form or another. We've been blessed to uh, work with the Central Church of Christ in Saraland, and I I went there uh, to work at, at working as an associate. Eventually, became as what they would say the pulpit minister for about eight or nine years, and and then decided that I was going to go into uh, uh, to, to real estate. And so when I did that, that was one of the most uh, difficult decisions that I made because I loved what I was doing. I loved the church where we were, and we had made the decision not to leave. But why do men have that need to, and there are all kinds of scenarios. Some men may go from uh, may never enter into that fully located work. Some men may do as I have to go in and out of those areas. Some may choose to, to work in that quote-unquote part-time situation. They may do it because of a number of reasons. Maybe they want uh, more time with their family or they, they want to live in a particular area or they make it because it's a financial decision. They may make it because of health reasons. Maybe their health doesn't allow them to do the same things that, uh, that, that might be demanded of them uh, in a fully located work. Some may do it because they're thinking of getting into retirement, and so they still want to be active workers for the Lord. Some may do it because uh, they're wanting to live closer to their grandchildren or their children. So there are hundreds of scenarios of, of why we do what we do. But I knew when I went into uh, working and having the vocation again other than ministry, that I, I knew that although things were well with us in the church, that, that the day would come that my ha hair would get even grayer and that the church would look and long for that day when they wanted the 35-year-old man with a 25-year experience and uh, who had four or five children. And I knew that day would come. So in a way, it was a financial decision uh, for us. In fact, I'll never forget that when we had uh, our, our daughter, our youngest daughter, had some health issues and uh, my wife, who worked as a social worker uh, tirelessly, worked from morning till night, and and we were needing that flexibility where uh, Rebecca could be at home more with our daughter. And I'll never forget that I mentioned to Rebecca, I said, Rebecca, have you ever thought about a career in real estate? I said, you, if you get into real estate, you you might have some you, some flexibility there to be with our daughter and. And to and work with uh, you know some good people. In fact, we knew a, a broker there uh, in the Mobile area. And she said, "Well, I'll think about it. Let's talk about it." And so we met with lunch uh, with our friend who was a broker at that time. And the more I listened, the more I thought, "I think I would like to do that." And so after the meeting, I got in the car and I asked Rebecca. I said, "What if I?" go back into uh, uh, having a vocation and I get into real estate and you just stay at home and marry Catherine. And she said, I like that even better. <laughs> so we all have our scenarios of, of why we do what we do, but we know one thing is that no matter what area we serve in, that it, it affects our families. It doesn't just affect us as ministers. And, and there are always going to be extremes, no matter... No matter whether a man is in a fully located uh, full-time work, as they say, or a part-time work, there are always going to be extremes. There are going to be those rare exceptions where whether you're full-time or part-time, there can be those who are lazy and do very little. I haven't seen very many of those kind of people, but I, I've seen a few in my life, but not because they were ministers. There are those also who are so committed to their ministry that they don't 
balance themselves and do the vocation that they should. And sometimes though, that's one of the things that I've struggled with is knowing when to be a realtor and stop being a minister because for me to say that out loud sounds like there's something wrong with that. Because having that full-time mindset is not an easy thing. The minister who has a secular job, he may excel and, and, and have many hours of Christian service but fail at that job that provides a, a living for his family. And then there may be the minister who has only time for his vocation and very little time for his family or very little time for his church work. So there are all kinds of extremes out there. There are some ministers who, who, who may even dedicate what may seem to be all of their time to their family, which seems to be a very noble thing at first. But if they're not committing themselves to their ministry and committing themselves to their vocation, then eventually it's going to cause problems in their family because they're not going to have a job or they're not going to have the source of support that they need to take care of their family. Or they will be ill-prepared when it comes to the pulpit and the Bible class and the everyday walks of Christian living. And so here we have the three most important areas of, our, of my life. And that's my Christian life, number one, my family life, and my, my vocation. And knowing how to balance those, to me, is like, have you ever seen the old variety shows? where the Chinese acrobats would come out or a, a magician would come out and, and they're spinning a plate on, a, uh, on this stick and they'll get one going here and then they go over and they get another plate going and they come over here and they get another plate going and they have five or six or seven going at the same time. I remember seeing that on TV as a child and so the next day I got up and I went to get my mom's uh, dinner plates, and I was going to try that. You know, in my mind as a child, I thought, if, if you can do it on television, surely you can do it. But my, thankfully, my mother caught me before I was able to get out the door to, to do that, to attempt that. But you know, the, the thing about that trick is that the plates aren't the same kind of plates that you and I eat off of. They're, they're, they're molded and formed and fitted in such a way that they have grooves and this indention in the center and, and they're molded and shaped for that purpose. To be able to spin. And so it's not the same, it doesn't have the same effect. And so knowing how to balance all of those plates at the same time is not easy. And so in order to be successful, number one, we do have to be better organized. We live in a world where we have the opportunity to organize ourselves maybe better than any other time in the history of the world because of the convenience that uh, media and even the cell phone <coughs> does. You know, I, I carry my cell phone right here because I'm a minister and because I'm a realtor. And I've never answered the phone while I was preaching or a real estate call while I was preaching. I don't think I've answered any call at any time. But see, the organization is, is our key to success. And, and you might say, well, how do I become more organized to be able to spin all of those plates at the same time? And one of the things that I think that we fail to do as ministers so very often is that we fail to ask for assistance. We fail to ask the church for our help for us to do our work because if I ask the brethren to help me to do my work, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like a sign of weakness. 
that I can't do the, the, the entire job of, of making all the calls and, and, and the Bible studies and the sermons and the lessons and, and all those things. And so it sounds like a sign of weakness. So I decide that, that I'm going to try to do it all myself. And I'll stay up late and get up early and do whatever is necessary because I don't want to ask for help. And I think that's one of the great mistakes that we make in the church for a lot of reasons. Number one, because it, it, it does make our hair turn faster. And number two is that we do a disservice to the church because we don't ask them to assist us. You think of these young men that spoke here tonight because they were asked to do so at, at an early age. I've, I, the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that that we need to have our our brethren that are sitting there in the in the pews getting up out of the pews more and doing more of the work that we have tried to do ourselves by ourselves. And whether it's getting someone to even shadow us in a Bible study or 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 to extend the invitation one night or or to preach a sermon or to do anything. We'll make better leaders and workers out of them. We'll make, help grow the church in a greater way if we stop thinking and realizing that we'll never do it ourselves, by ourselves. And so a part of the organization and keeping those plates spinning is making sure that we're calling upon the brethren. There in 1 Corinthians 12, you remember that when it talked about the, uh, the church being many members but yet one body. You know, there's the ear and the eye and the hand and the foot. They all have different works. They all have different services and ministries and strengths in, in, as we do in the church today. And we have brethren that are literally rotting in the pews because we're not balancing ourselves. We're afraid to, to ask for help. We have to understand in ministry that we do have our limitations. And that is a great conflict with us. And I think that part of that is being willing to communicate to our brethren. You know, we have to have organization, yes, but ministers of, of anyone in this world should, shouldn't they be better communicators than other people? Sometimes as ministers, we're the worst. Because we don't call upon the brethren or we don't have an understanding with them. And, and, and especially when you're in a bivocational uh, situation. I think it's better to sit down and talk with your eldership and, and in a sense talk with the church and have a better understanding that these are going to be my limitations, not because I don't want to do some of these things. I remember going on a minister interview one time at a, at an air, in an area. I was called and I actually went and just met with the elders first and the congregation, had, the minute the elders had called me and and they'd given me a list of the things that, that they thought was very important, that my areas of responsibility, and I thought, this is great. You know, we're going to have a great communication if this works out. And they said, okay, one of the first things that you're going to do is make sure that the building, church building, is open uh, for every church service, and it's locked after everyone leaves. And by the way, if you don't block it and something happens and something goes missing, we're going to have to probably charge you for what's taken. And we want you to do the church bullet because that's very important. And if anyone within a the range of a second cousin dies in the church, of any church member, we want you to go to their funeral. Those were the top three qualifications. And we ended early that night. 
And I said, I, I think you need a custodian and a secretary. But I'm not sure that you need a minister. I'm not sure that the idea of spinning those plates is quite exactly what they had in mind. I know our time is moving along, but another thing that I believe is important in maintaining balance is learning not to be too hard on ourselves. I can tell you that this is one of the things that I struggle with. Over the years, I, no matter how much I feel that I would do for the Lord, there were always those things that were undone. And isn't it true that no matter what position we're in in the church, that we'll always have those thoughts? It doesn't matter how many hours you have, there will always be those things that you think are undone. And so, there will always be those things of which we have no control over. And because of that, it can discourage us. And because of that, some people actually go so far as to being so guilty of uh, what they can't do in their ministry that, that they get out of ministry. And if they get out of ministry, they've defeated the very reason uh, that they went into it in the first place. Sometimes there is no exact answer. And I've had to learn that, that not only was it important to communicate with my brethren, but it's important in my family, but it's important important to communicate with myself and to know that, that there are some things that, that I'm just not going to be able to do. Not because my heart is not there. I, I could easily name a dozen different things. And I guess we're all like this, but I could easily name you a dozen different things that if I could travel back in time that I would have done differently as a minister. And I can tell you that there would be times that I wish I had been more patient. I wish I had been more balanced. I wish I had been more organized or communicated better. I, I wish I had been more tolerant. Times that <coughs> where I saw that it was time for me to move on, not because, and, and I believe that every church that I've ever served had, and I don't want you to go take a poll in case I'm wrong about this, but I think in every church that I've ever served, I don't think I've ever left where I couldn't go back there. But I might leave for other reasons because I had the good of the church at heart or my family or, or the situation that was there at that time. But if I had been patient enough and in my thought process and realized that there are some things I just can't fix, that I might have stayed longer. I might have been able to do more good. And so life is always about change. And, and another thing that I struggle with is sometimes being flexible. You know, I, I'm the kind that likes to eat the same food, uh, the, the same kind of food, uh, every day, you know, almost. I, I like the same kind of clothes. Uh, my wife will joke with me that if I go pick out my clothes, she'll say, oh, you picked out your uniform today. <laughs> because I, I like the same stripes on my shirts, and, and I like the same kind of pants, and the same kind of shoes, and, and, and I don't like to deviate from that. I don't like the flexibility of, uh, I remember one time uh, Rebecca bought me this suit and I it was just eating me up because I, I felt like a clown. But it looked like everyone else's suit. But it just didn't look like mine. You see, one of the problems with maintaining balance is we have to constantly reevaluate where we are as Christians and as ministers and as husbands and fathers and make the adjustments. Things in this world do not 
do not stay the same. So we have to have the mindset of not a, a, opposing certain changes. Maybe, maybe balance. Yes, if I could do it over again, there would be many things that I would do differently, but I can tell you that there are probably a lot of things that I have forgotten about that I still would have done the same way. So don't beat yourself up over what is not possible. I think we have to look around and look at the tools that God has given us. And by vocational ministry, my vocation, we provide training. We provide opportunity for advancement. We, we provide uh, promotion. And, and we provide all these different things that, to, that help us to be successful. And yet sometimes in the church, our mind stays the same. And, and I'm not talking about things pertaining to doctrine. I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about using my time in the best way for the Lord. And I know our time is, uh, is up. And to those of you in the balcony, I'm thankful that you hung in there with us tonight. It's, it's especially good to be home. I, I feel like I'm home here. Uh, every time I come to Heritage, uh, love and appreciate so much uh, uh, Brenda and Wayne and Philip and Dennis and all the other people. But I can tell you that the coming here changed my mindset. It did not change the fact that that I would one day have another vocation. But it changed the most important part about me, and that was my Christian life. And my understanding of the importance of evangelism, and the church, and family. And so those things I'll be forever thankful for. And I may not always be a real estate, but we always need to be a Christian no matter what we do. The day may come when I may not be up in the pulpit preaching. I'm sure as uh, many times that I've had the opportunity to do in the past. But I still have the responsibility of being a faithful child of God no matter what. And I'd like to encourage you and leave you with this. That <coughs> if you're working in a bivocational situation, I'd like to encourage you to do an evaluation when you get home of yourself. Don't do one of me. I've already done that several times. That's how I came up with some of these points. But do an evaluation of the things that you know that can help you to be a better minister, to be a better worker in your secular job, because that's a reflection on who you are as a Christian and as a minister. But look at the things that, that may be holding you back, the things that are out of balance. And whatever is out of balance, think about those things and try to bring them back into balance. <coughs> Rebecca made that statement, uh, like I said, uh, she was joking a little bit, but she knows that one of the things that I struggle with is Finding that fine balance. And so, if I have trouble finding it for myself, always, I know I'm not going to find it for you. You are the only one that can do that for yourself.